good evening to all of you. First of all, I should uh, congratulate uh, Kotayam Nature Club and LVP Nature Society for organizing these wonderful talks. I've been regularly attending them, a range of interesting topics and some really amazing speakers across the board. Pradeep Kishan, Ravi Chalam, some very young uh, um, field researchers and naturalists. So it's been wonderful. Uh, what a great way to spend uh, uh, lockdown, at least an hour and a half in the evening, almost every day. So uh, congratulations to um, Kotayam Nature Club, LP Nature Society, and David, especially, for anchoring these talks. So a couple of things before I start off. So we have had a lot of, uh, like I said, uh, scientists speaking, conservationists speaking, field biologists speaking. But uh, the role of a naturalist, I want to just explain before I proceed is a little different. I mean, we are very eager to learn a lot and uh, gather a lot of information and uh, get to know more and more fascinating uh, subjects. But when it comes to guiding guests, the challenge is how, how little to speak. Meaning, we can't really um, overwhelm them with all the information and uh, things what we learn. So our challenge is that. So uh, to get them excited, tell them stories, and um, get them fascinated by, uh, by the behavior of animals, the beauty of animals and habitats, and uh, try and get them uh, more involved, and uh, make them fall in love, basically. And uh, so eventually contribute to, um, to uh, growing in the number of people who love nature and wildlife, and therefore um, create the public opinion. Uh, which would result, hopefully, in conservation. So all the researchers who have been talking, the field biologists who have been talking, um, the scientists, all of us have the same role to play ultimately, that is uh, conservation. Uh, there was this interesting talk on uh, the um, um, rock just, just about four or five days back. And uh, she was talking about this lady. Um, Ecology of Rocky Outcrops. Yeah, Dr. Aparna Watwe. So she made a very interesting statement. The statement was that, you know, there was, she was going on doing research uh, with her, I mean, guided by her, uh, her uh, mentors and others. But then they realized that what's the point of going on doing all this research unless we conserve. So, they, so she jumped into conservation because a lot of these fragile landscapes ultimately need that. So you need to conserve them and, and uh, not just go on doing research. So somewhere there we fit in, the naturalists. So uh, this talk is about the uh, fascinating uh, birds which I have seen uh, um, during my trips to the uh, uh, Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, 2011, I was very fortunate to go to both the poles in the same year. And uh, after that, um, I had one more trip to the Arctic in 2017. But most of the pictures are from 2011 uh, trips. Um, so this, this, there's so, so many beautiful, amazing, and fascinating birds there. So this uh, talk is about that. I hope uh, it will be interesting and uh, fascinating for all of you. A couple of disclaimers before uh, I start off. One is that I'm not a great photographer. Um, so most of, the, most of the photographs are record shots, you could say, because the, the standards which are raised now uh, have been highly, um, I mean, the bar has been highly raised. Uh, uh, especially you could see the people who were talking in the last few uh, days, uh, um, fantastic photography. So uh, these photographs are just about okay. Secondly, it's not a very scientific talk. So at the end of the talk, at the end of the session, if you ask me many scientific questions, taxonomy and all that, I may not be uh, uh, in the right position to answer that, but I'll try my best. Okay, shall we start off then? So like I said, 2017, um, in June, I first went to the Arctic. Uh -huh. I'm trying to change the slide. Okay, there you are. So, this is the uh, map of the Arctic uh, Circle, and it shows uh, the North Pole and the um, nearby countries surrounding the North Pole. Um, the interesting thing is that the North Pole is just sea, surrounded by landmass. And whereas Antarctica is the opposite, it's a landmass surrounded by seas. So where I actually went to for this trip is a place called 
Svalbard. This is the archipelago of Svalbard, otherwise also known as Spitsbergen. This was uh, uh, formerly a Dutch uh, territory, and later on it became Norwegian territory. This is uh, mainland Norway. And um, Norway and Russia had some little disputes, but it was finally settled uh, about 25 years back, and it's uh, exclusively a Norwegian territory. So this is a, uh, a wonderful nature reserve. It's about 30,000 square kilometers, and one of the, it has one of the highest densities of uh, mammals like polar bears, and of course a lot of, lot of birds which come to breed during the summer. So the, when the ice starts melting, this is when uh, uh, tourists or uh, guests can go to uh, the, this area. So uh, after some research, uh, we chose this area to take uh, guests to because it's uh, a fascinating area. It's got very less uh, human habitation. It's just got two towns. One is Longerbien, this town you can see. Okay, it's time to go there, I guess. This is Longerbien, which has uh, about 800 people to 1,000 people in the summertime and uh, comes down to about 200 people during the winter. And then there's one more uh, uh, small town, which is a research uh, uh, station. I mean, not station, many stations there, uh, including India has a research station there, Ne Ellison. So these are the only two towns, um, or not even towns, I'm just saying habitation. The rest of it is uninhabited by humans, and it's a, it's a great refuge for a lot of animals and birds. Uh, so that's longer being for you. This is, gives you an... Oh, sorry. That gives you an idea about the... Um, the uh, long lat of uh, Longibian, 78 degrees north, if you can see, and the rest of the cities around it. So, uh, of course, it was so exciting to land in Longibian in, uh, in uh, the month of June, and I was just very eager to get uh, to the ship, which was, uh, we had uh, been given two hours of time once we landed uh, in the airport um, to uh, board the ship, because the ship just came back in the morning, so they need to do a full uh, refurbishment of the ship and then we uh, check in. So our main bags are already uh, taken away at the airport itself. So they just said that you can just go around with your backpack and uh, walk around the town and then finally come to board the ship around four o'clock. So we had about two, two and a half hours of time. And um, I made a big mistake in, my, in the baggage which I checked in, uh, my um, binoculars also and the, uh, the 100, 400 lens was all given away. So I had just a small camera and uh, just walking around, and there was this fascinating first sight. A bird which I was dying to see for so many years was right in front of my eyes, but a very uh, unnatural setup. It was uh, perched on a little metal gate, and that's the Arctic turn for you. So it was, I was just, I almost fell, uh, uh, my heart almost stopped saying, wow, this is the Arctic turn right in front of us. And um, since I had the smaller camera, at least I could take a few uh, pictures. And there was this fascinating bird right in front. It was uh, the um, male and the female were uh, incubating an egg. And they have a very short time to uh, do that in the Arctic summer. Um, around end of May, they start uh, uh, breeding. And uh, once they start breeding, they have about 21 days to incubate the egg, another 21 days to 24 days to fledge the bird. And uh, after that, a lot of feeding happens. And uh, within a month, the bird will start, um, will join the parents and to start their incredible uh, migration. As most of you would know that this has the longest migration across from the North Pole to the South Pole and, and, and back. So uh, in that short time, of course, they're very aggressively defending their nests. If you go anywhere close, you'll get a big, um, a, a, a sharp um, hit on your head with that beak. And uh, so that was, that's what, that was what was happening. I was trying not to disturb them because uh, um, so they have such a short uh, breeding time. And you can see, without any hair on my head, fortunately, protected by a monkey cap or a, uh, this thing, I was a little bit safer. But they were going on um, trying to protect their, um, their nest. There were many birds there, so I didn't uh, really walk around too much. Just took a few pictures and then... This was somewhere in uh, Ney uh, Ellison, that research town I was talking about. Um, somebody else was walking ahead and took this picture to show how aggress aggressively they defend their uh, nests. And this is a map which shows the, uh, um, there were this um, Arctic terns which were uh, um, tagged, geotagged, uh, just recently, about 2011, I think. It was, uh, it is, a study was done by the 
Greenland Institute of uh, Natural Resources. And uh, we found out a lot more uh, intricate details about their migration, about how, what are the routes which they take, and uh, what is the distance covered. And it's fascinating. So previously we knew, I mean, before this, uh, um, these scientific tools were introduced, that uh, they do go to the Antarctic and come back, but a lot more detail was revealed by these uh, um, geotags and the study done by Greenland, uh, Greenland Institute of Natural Resources. So what it revealed is that the Arctic terns uh, start their uh, south, uh, um, southbound uh, leg around uh, June, July, and they cover about 34,600 kilometers. Uh, the daily progress is something like 330 kilometers. And they come, like you see here, the green is shows that southbound migration. And they come to different parts of uh, Antarctica, and they're there to <clears throat> spend their summer in Antarctica starting from November, December, January, about three months. And then after that, they start, um, this red shows where they're feeding. Uh, that is the uh, winter feeding grounds. And then they start, the yellow shows uh, the trajectory of their path going back to the Arctic uh, region. This is uh, originating from Greenland, of course, because the birds were tagged there, but I'm talking about even more north, that is Svalbard. And then they get back. While well, going back, they uh, cover about 25,700 kilometers. And while going back, they fly much faster uh, because they catch the tailwind. And they fly about, daily progress is about 520 kilometers a day. And they come back in time for the Arctic summer, somewhere around May or June. And in this process, they would have um, covered something like an average of 70,000 kilometers per bird every year. And very interesting uh, um, story about how Arctic terns live up to the age of 30. The tiny birds, you saw the size of them, about 120, 100, 100 to 120 grams the weight. And look at this uh, endurance of the migration which they undertake. So, uh, so in their whole lifetime, it is estimated that they uh, cover something like 2.5 million uh, kilometers. And that's three times the distance from Earth to Moon and back. That is the fascinating thing about the Arctic turn migration. So the very first bird I could see uh, uh, in Svalbard was this Arctic turn. So it's a fascinating landscape. It's um, uh, full of glaciers and some of them are carving right in front of you. And um, a lot of beautiful birds all around. These are a group of, uh, a flock of uh, kitty wakes. I have some closer shots of these birds. This is the most abundant turn in the Arctic region. Uh, very pretty bird with black legs and black wings and uh, fully white with a yellow beak. And they're, they're in big flocks like this. So also known as the black-legged uh, kittiwakes. And this uh, uh, scene in front of you, um, a lot of people don't expect this. They think, okay, Arctic or uh, Arctic is all filled with ice and snow and it's white. It's not so for those three months. For the three months, there's this beautiful bloom of wildflowers and uh, a lot of greenery around and uh, a lot of these birds and some of the animals like the Svalbard reindeer uh, and the, um, that's the only mammal actually, only herbivore there. They're all busy feeding and the birds are breeding and they're raising the young ones. And of course, uh, the polar bears are crawling around. So it's a, it's a big burst of life in those uh, three months of the uh, Arctic summer. This is another fascinating bird. It's the long-tailed uh, squaw. Um, and you can notice it's been, uh, it's uh, carrying a, a ring around its uh, leg. Um, I tried to see the uh, code marking on that and follow it with Norwegian Institute of, uh, of um, Polar Research or something. I didn't really get this bird, but I did, doing some fascinating research on this bird. Again, um, breeds in the Arctic region, the long-tailed squaw. These are um, the, um, the barnacle geese, which also come to breed during that time. There's an interesting story about them, that uh, their population was down to, to just about, just a minute, right? A few hundred in the uh, 1970s, sorry, 1940, and then um, uh, good conservation work and protection um, has made the population come to something like 25 to 30,000 now. 
And you can see a lot of young chicks with the, the barnacle bees. Ah, this is one fascinating uh, area where you sail past and the captain of a ship announced that uh, we're going to actually anchor and you can get off in the small uh, inflatable boats and go a little closer to this massive 100 meter granite cliffs, uh, sorry, basaltic cliffs, um, which is known as, uh, a, it's also called, uh, the Norwegian word for it is uh, Alkafeljelet, which actually means bird mountain. And these are these uh, huge, uh, very tall nesting cliffs full of birds which are uh, breeding during this Arctic summer. It's fascinating, uh, but unfortunately the sea was slightly rough. You, you, know, you can see the foreground in this picture. So the captain announced that we can't really anchor, but he said, I'm sailing past this as slow as possible. So we could get a good glimpse of the cliffs and could hear these calls of so many thousands of birds which are breeding. Uh, on that. Mainly the birds which are breeding there are the, uh, you can see the birds, the black and white birds. I have a slightly closer picture. See all of them. These are the um, guillemots. The main species is the Brunwick's guillemot and there's some kitty wakes too and um, then attended on to them by, uh, attended on by a few of these gulls. You can see this big gull here. It's called the glycos gull and uh, uh, some arctic foxes. And they come to predate on the uh, eggs and some of the young ones of the birds. Uh, we couldn't see Arctic foxes. Somebody said that they got a glimpse, but I couldn't see it um, because the ship also, it has its own challenges when the sea is a little rough, it's bobbing up and down. But anyway, it's a fascinating, fascinating, fascinating spectacle of uh, these thousands and thousands of birds which are uh, uh, breeding there. Yeah, these are the um, guillemots. And the, one of the advantage of uh, breeding on these high cliffs is that um, they avoid predators, of course, as much as possible. Like I said, sometimes some Arctic foxes try and um, get the eggs of the chicks. And once the chicks are fledged, they just can fly from there and land directly in the water. Once again, take a shortcut to the water and avoid any land predators. So they're flying all about and you can see uh, I mean, the calls are fascinating actually. There are lots and lots of birds calling. These are the guillemots. Sorry. So this is the gull I was talking about. This is a predator. Uh, it's a glaucous gull. It is quite a large bird. Um, wingspan about five, five and a, five and a half feet. And um, it um, uh, weighs about uh, 1.5 to 2.7 kilos. And it's largest of the common gulls found there. And uh, they predate a lot on these um, uh, eggs and uh, chicks of uh, these birds, all the birds which uh, like kitty wakes, like ops you'll see in the next slide, and uh, guillemots, which you just saw. And while I was just clicking some pictures uh, of uh, those cliffs, okay, this is one of the uh, nice pictures of the um, landscape around in the Arctic. There's a glacier here. This has been named July the 14th glacier. Um, and our ship, which has dropped us on the, along uh, the fjord on the, um, this, somewhere this side, it just came around and it started, it anchored there so that uh, we're out on small treks that day, small, medium and long treks. You can see some people here, uh, you can see the laser pointer. And then um, we get picked up at the bottom of this uh, place and go back to the uh, ship. So like I said, as while I was taking pictures, and this is another slide of the landscape of the place. In fact, uh, the original name for this uh, um, archipelago is called Spitsbergen, which is in Dutch language. It means jagged peaks. And you can see the jagged peaks of this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, shot. Yeah, this is a big nesting colony of another uh, very small, cute bird called the little auk. Little auk, which looks like a, a actually like a small miniature uh, uh, penguin. And this is the most numerous bird in the Arctic uh, area. The other one, Kittivek, is the most numerous, gull. And this also known as the dove key. And they're very fast birds and uh, they can fly at something like 60 to 70 kilometers per hour. And they dive up to 30 meters. They're diving birds which uh, go after krill and uh, other, uh, other uh, prey. So this is a close-up picture of that little lock, really cute. Yeah, and if you notice, a lot of these birds, including the penguins in Antarctica, have this kind of a color, um, um, color pattern, uh, white in the front and black head sometimes and uh, dark back, um, backs or black backs. This is uh, also little ox on flight. And like I said, while I was uh, uh, just taking some pictures of where the little ox were, 
and I got another bird which was fully white and didn't know which bird it was. Just got one uh, decent shot of it. And later on, on the ship, I was, uh, there's one Russian scientist who was giving a talk on uh, his work in Russia. And he works uh, uh, specifically on this uh, uh, highly uh, endangered bird called the ivory gull. And uh, then I said, oh, when he showed me his slides, showed us his slides, uh, then I thought I got that picture and I showed him this picture and he said, yes, yes this is an ivory gull. And it's a fascinating bird, fully white with a yellow beak and a um, little bit about the ivory gull. Um, the um, um, the uh, scientific name for it is Pagophilia uh, eubernia. Uh, it's interesting because Pagophilia means lover of sea ice and uh, eubernia means ivory colored. It's a near threatened bird. It's a high Arctic species, and uh, there's supposed to be just about um, 8,000 odd pairs left, and most of them are in Russian Arctic. This is another interesting bird. It's called the Northern Fulmar, uh, F U L M A R. And uh, Fulmar in Norwegian uh, is uh, the, the bird is named uh, after, uh, it's, it's broken up into two, full F U L means actually fowl in Norwegian. Mar is a bird. And why is it called uh, a, a fowl bird? Because it's got some interesting behavior. It has this uh, stomach juices, which are highly pungent. And this bird uses those, that stomach juice sometimes to defend itself. If some of the birds come close to it and trying to st uh, steal the kill. Actually, this is a, a killer, of, uh, sorry, a stealer of kills or, uh, or food from other birds. But in that fight, it will try to eject that uh, uh, the uh, stomach juices onto other birds, uh, like a defensive mechanism or offensive also at times. Uh, and then the other uh, uh, use for that stomach juice is that it's like a fuel for long flights. Uh, this is a very, you know, bird which flies long distances. And thirdly, it's also used to regurgitate and feed its young, one, uh, its young ones, northern fulmar. I just got one decent shot of this bird, I think. Oh, this is a fascinating uh, predator uh, there. It's uh, known as the um, great squaw. Um, it's a, known as the pirate of the sea. It's also a kleptoparasite. It steals uh, prey and kills from other birds and also um, um, does a lot of feeding on carrion and um, um, attacks even larger birds like the gannets. And if, in case there's a, uh, a whale carcass or something, you'll find a lot of these birds. So they're also play a big role as a scavenger of this uh, region. A pretty big bird, the great, um, great squaw. Coming to some smaller birds, this is uh, a red fowl rope, which is a wader, um, also known as a gray fowl rope in the rest of Northern Europe. Here it's known as a red fowl rope. Um, it's, a, it's a female, which is actually colorful. The male is grayish in color. And another wader there called the purple sandpiper, which also comes to breed here in the Arctic. Uh, this is um, the uh, common eider duck, uh, one of the few duck species there. We also have one is a little bit more colorful than this known as the king eider. And you can see the male and the females. Eiders in flight. Oh, why suddenly a polar bear picture uh, in, a, in a presentation which is focusing on birds. Um, I just put this uh, slide because uh, very interesting interrelationship. This uh, um, female polar bear was uh, patrolling the shores of uh, one of the uh, land masses, uh, looking for the eggs of uh, eiders, both king eider and uh, common eiders. Because the female polar bears, once they come out of the hibernation, they are looking for any ready source of food. And since their body mass is much smaller compared to the males, they don't mind just getting eggs and uh, sometimes some birds and things like that. So the first thing they look for, which is like instant food for them, is uh, the uh, eggs of uh, eiders. So she was patrolling the uh, shore of this uh, um, um, small island. And sure enough, it got some eggs. They're slightly far, so go, but through the binoculars, one could clearly see it was feeding on um, eggs. It just fed, uh, swallowed one egg of the um, common eider or king eider, we're not sure. We had a polar bear expert on our ship. Uh, coming back to that, um, in this um, uh, expedition style cruises, we have a lot of experts on board and they give talks during the um, 
in, in the time we are on, on board because every day we get out of the ship for about three hours in the morning. It's like a morning safari uh, on the small inflatable boats. And then we get back. And then during the lunch break and the um, time for the evening safari, uh, there are experts which are giving talks. So uh, the expedition leader for this particular uh, expedition in 2011, he was an expert on, on uh, polar bears. He actually wrote a book on polar bears. His second book was coming out. Um, so he was giving us, and fortunately, I was on his uh, inflatable uh, zodiac uh, when he was giving, uh, telling us about uh, what she was doing with this particular polar bear. So this is the uh, a nice um, uh, representation of uh, the uh, food, uh, Arctic food chain. Um, so they have this small uh, um, features called the diatoms and copy pods, and uh, which are the uh, primary uh, producers uh, along with algae. And uh, all this is uh, the the uh, the basis of the food chain is these the algae, diatoms, and copy pods, and then they are fed by small fish like Arctic cod, which is one of the most numerous fish found there, and they in turn are fed by the ring seals and then the polar bears uh, being the apex predator. And all this is um, dependent on the Arctic ice, which you can see here, because the algae grows clinging onto this ice. Because ice actually is fresh water, as you know. And the fresh water gives uh, rise to all these uh, um, microorganisms. And that forms the basis of the food chain. And that's the uh, one which is on threat, under threat now, the ice itself. That's why I put this slide to show you what's happening there. So there's something called the Arctic sea ice extinct, extent, sorry. And this has been uh, uh, mapped from 1979 through satellites. Before that, we just had records. And uh, it is showing a, a, a very alarming decline um, in the sea ice extinct. Um, so the maximum we could see is in light blue. And this was, this was uh, you know, going all the way to Alaska and to northern Canada and other parts of Russia, but now it's down to this uh, part, the minimum, um, and it's come down by about uh, by about half in the last uh, uh, 30 years. It's been uh, um, actually uh, measured or uh, mapped. I'll just give you some statistics on that. So 1980, it was at its peak. Like I said, the satellite map started coming from 1980. Uh, it was at uh, the maximum ice, sea ice, Arctic sea ice extent was 7 million square kilometers. 2012, steady decline till 2012, it came to its minimum. It's just under two, uh, sorry, 3 million square kilometers. So we're talking about 50% decline. And there's a slight increase in 2015, 17, but not much. But that's what is the, uh, the, um, um, the massive uh, decline in the uh, sea ice extent and this is of course because we all know the causes the main causes being the uh, global warming of the seas and the climate climate change which is happening in fact in 2017 uh, when i went to arctic back like i said uh, there was this uh, very um, scary kind of a scenario we were uh, trying to uh, that was the last day of uh, uh, the tour and the ship anchored back in long Ribbon after 10 days of sailing and i just uh, drew the curtains of the uh, porthole and it was uh, drizzling out there. Okay. Um, so one doesn't hear of uh, any rain uh, or precipitation in uh, that uh, high latitude, uh, alt um, latitude of 78 to 80 degrees north. So anyway, we had to get off the ship. We took some, um, you know, the uh, jackets and stuff like that. And like I said, when we boarded it, the same uh, uh, process, all the big, uh, big bags are left behind there and they transferred directly to the airport. So we have two more hours to walk around to, uh, before we take the flight back to uh, Northern Europe. And we are walking around and we are all very uh, keen to get some back in contact with the world, uh, so-called uh, so Wi-Fi kind of a thing. So we walked to the uh, cafe which, uh, where we went to to get our copies and stuff while coming in. And sure enough, the cafe was closed because it was slightly early, Saturday, something like 8.39 in the morning. But our Wi-Fi messages, I mean, sorry, WhatsApp messages started coming because it caught the Wi-Fi signal. And uh, eventually, when the lady came to open the cafe, we were just having, uh, just having a con conversation with her saying, what's happening, rain. She said that in her lifetime, she never saw rain in Arctic. And it's been raining for the last five days. And uh, she was saying that the prediction is that it will rain for another five days. So there's been a huge, huge change in, uh, in climate and other conditions, and especially the ice melt, which is the most alarming thing. Um, for example, the, sorry, the uh, first ship 
which crossed uh, the uh, the northern passage um, in uh, the northern sea route it's called because this really shortens the um, the sea route between Asia and Europe and, and uh, North America um, um, by something like 40 percent. And the first ship which crossed, this is a representational picture of course, uh, first ship which crossed without the help of icebreakers was in August 2017. So the Northern Sea route is fast opening up. After that I believe many many ships passed including Chinese cargo ships. So imagine once it opens up for uh, commercial uh, um, sea um, lanes, uh, th that's going to be a big devastating, uh, that's going to have a huge devastating effect on the Arctic sea ice and uh, the entire ecosystem. So something like this. This is the farthest north we got in 2012, uh, sorry, 11 trip, uh, just 500 miles from the geographical North Pole. And you can see there is this pack ice as, as far as I can see. And that is the stronghold. That is the habitat of the uh, polar bear. And this is one of the best uh, polar bear sightings we had during that time. This is a male polar bear. You can see by its size and it's uh, a big bear. And so this is at stake now, their home, that is the ice. Okay, coming to the bottom of the, um, our uh, beautiful planet, Antarctica. Um, so like I said, in November of 2011, uh, I could go to Antarctica itself. This, both these were my uh, recce trips to set up some tours for these uh, beautiful places, fascinating poles. So Antarctica trip starts from uh, somewhere here. That uh, the particular town which from where we start is somewhere here. Uh, it is there actually, not somewhere. Uh, you can see my pointer, uh, but it's not mentioned on that. It's called Ushuaia, and that's in Argentina. And uh, from there uh, we set sail. Uh, in fact, we took the same ship which uh, we took uh, uh, in uh, uh, to the Arctic, the Plantius. I have a picture of that in the next slide. So I set sail from there and it takes 52 hours to cross some of the most uh, tumultuous or uh, stormy uh, seas in the world. That is the Drake Passage. This is the distance. This is about 1,000 kilometers. Um, and uh, you can see the Drake Passage. So that is like very, very uh, rough seas. We were already warned by the captain in the uh, two hour long briefing, including safety briefing and all that, saying that, you know, you need to uh, take uh, all the precautions possible. There's a ship doctor uh, whom we can consult for uh, seasickness and uh, things like that. And so we're all bracing up for that. And the ship which came uh, from the uh, trip, the morning, uh, that morning uh, evening, we were boarding it. So uh, since uh, there were a lot of crew members we already knew, I uh, was just talking to them. So how was the uh, passage while coming back? They said, 60 foot waves. <laughs> and, you know, most of the ship was seasick. So we are bracing ourselves for that. And you know, we uh, some from some landlocked uh, South Indian cities, obviously we don't have any experience with the seas. So it's going to be tough, we brace ourselves. And sure enough, at midnight, uh, the day we left uh, Ushuaia, the, sh the big wave started striking the ship and we're just going like that, topsy -turvy. It was like quite challenging. So this is our, our ship, the Plantius. It's a um, small ship of, um, um, has a capacity of 106 passengers and 40 crew. Um, so medium sized ship, not small. And this was uh, initially, initially a Dutch research uh, uh, ship, vessel, which was bought over by this company and converted into a, 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 a tourism uh, operation. So um, everything was, uh, this ship was really well kitted out uh, in terms of taking those big waves and things like that. So there was this British uh, bird watcher uh, who was, uh, this was his fifth trip to the Antarctic. So he was saying that uh, he never had uh, a ship which was so well kitted out and things like that. So, um, so in the morning, uh, the, the waves were really high and most of the passengers were, uh, uh, seasick and uh, went down to the dining area and there were hardly anybody there. And I saw that guy, his name was David, I said, the, uh, he was leading a small group of four to five bird watchers. And I saw him on the way down um, and then when I came back, he was not there. So I asked the ship crew uh, where he was and they, one of them could direct me to the rear of the ship. And then I, there I saw him fully, of course, wearing layers of clothes and a jacket and he just said, wait here. 
So that's, I just holding on to something I could get because the, sh the sea was really rough. And when the, when the ship goes down like that, you will feel as if the sea is coming into the ship, <laughs> that kind of a rough seas. And then I realized, uh, I mean, why he asked me to wait. There was this beautiful, beautiful albatrosses coming out from the ocean following our ship. And I was just, once again, just like when I saw the Arctic turn the first time, my heart almost stopped. The same uh, kind of a thrill at seeing these masses of the sky, the albatrosses. This particular albatross is the black-browed albatross. Um, and this was just following the ship and soaring like this. And a beautiful, beautiful uh, bird. You'll just, it's fascinating to see these birds. And there you are, all your seasickness is gone once you see and focus on these uh, beautiful uh, uh, creatures. So uh, they, they gave a great show, not just this, but a lot of other albatrosses started coming out. Um, the, this is the same black broad albatross. This was um, the, uh, the most numerous albatross we saw known as a ship follower. Uh, of course, most albatrosses, like I said, do that, but this particular one really follows the ships. So you can see, this is like about eight and a half, nine foot wingspan, not like the big ones, the wandering and the royal albatrosses, which are about 12 foot uh, wingspan. This is about eight and a half foot, but fascinating. So just a few slides of this uh, beautiful bird. The way they soar is amazing. You see that a pair of uh, same black broad albatrosses. So albatrosses follow this uh, interesting um, technique of uh, um, uh, soaring, and just like uh, some of our vultures do and uh, other birds do, which do, uh, um, 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 do catch hold of these thermals. But here they do what is known as dynamic soaring, which is basically uh, flying between two air masses. So um, what they do is that they turn into the wind, gaining height, and when they gain height, then they drop down to the too close to the water because the wind is, which is slowed down by friction. Uh, it slows down the speed there, but 15 feet above the water, it, they gain speed, the wind gains speed. And the albatrosses catch that and then they soar up again, uh, gaining almost like 40 miles per hour speed. And this, they keep on repeating this, you know, going into the wind, dropping down, gaining speed, going up again and they can keep on doing this for days together. And these are truly the masters of the skies or the ocean currents. And um, they, they do th th some fascinating records, which I'll just read out to give an idea about this uh, amazing birds. Their lifespan is almost like for up to 50 years. Some birds are known to live out even up to 60 years, but average lifespan is up to 50 years. They have a very long adolescence, something like 10 years, eight to 10 years and long fledgling also stage, the parents keep on uh, raising the chicks uh, to, up to up to about nine months. And these are circumnavigators of the globe, especially the Southern Seas. And there are about 22 species in the world uh, and about six species in the Southern Seas in Antarctica where we went. And uh, there's some, they hold some amazing records. They fly up to thousand kilometers a day at about 50 miles an hour. Uh, one of the wandering albatross, which was uh, tagged, it covered a, a incredible 120,000, 1 lakh 20,000 kilometers in a year. And one of the gray-headed albatross, whose picture I'll show you after a few slides, it covered 13,670 miles in just 46 days. And they're looking for food, and especially when they're raising the chicks, they cover something like sometimes 800 to 1,000 kilometers a day to go and get the food for the uh, young ones. So these are like true masters, true endurance flyers of the, of, the, of the oceans. It's amazing to see these birds. So first glimpse after the Drake passage, after the, the rough uh, um, journey on the sea, like I said, but of course I was totally fascinated by the albatrosses. And another beautiful uh, part of uh, uh, trips to the poles in the summer is that you have almost 24 hours daylight. Uh, in this case, when we went in December, it was 22 hours. So you can go anytime uh, to the uh, deck, which is open, because the, uh, when the ship is going through the deck passage, they only have one rear deck open because for safety. So to be careful in the way you go there. And, uh, and then once you're there, you just keep seeing albatrosses and other birds like petrels and some other birds I'll show you pictures of now. And you're like, you forget about the rough uh, oceans. 
And but the first glimpses of the Antarctic Antarctic landmass is something amazing. These are some few shots of the landscape where you see the Antarctica, Antarctic landscape. So Antarctica is this amazing uh, continent which is known to be um, sorry, it's like the coldest, driest, windiest, and the highest continent in the world. Highest, why? Because the ice has been piling up on this continent for so many years that the average elevation of Antarctica is 2.5 miles above mean sea level. That's how much ice and fresh water, in other words, has piled up in Antarctica for millions of years. So it is said that 70, up to 70% of all uh, fresh water is locked up in the glaciers of Antarctica. And 90% of all ice uh, on, on Earth is in Antarctica. And uh, if the, all the ice melts of Antarctica um, melts, it is said that the sea levels on the world would rise by about 200 feet, just to give you some idea about how much is locked up there. And it's uh, not only the coldest, driest, windiest, highest, but it's also the most intelligent continent. You know why? In about 45 to 50 research stations, at the peak summer, there are about 50,000 scientists who, who stay in Antarctica. Let's say 90% of them are scientists, the rest of them are support crew. So you can imagine the brains uh, which are uh, there in Antarctica in all the research stations. So, so uh, that's Antarctica for you. Fascinating, fascinating landscape and continent. Some more pictures of the landscape uh, of Antarctica. You can go there just for landscapes. And the first glimpse of this fascinating birds, the penguins. Uh, our very first stop was this beautiful colony of uh, chin strap penguins, which are tiny, just small. Average height is about one, 15 inches, a little over uh, one foot. And these are really hardworking penguins. And in this case, uh, somewhere below there, they are uh, gathering some pebbles or rocks from and climbing all the way to a site which is their nesting site. Almost, it's almost a kilometer up or somebody said 1.5 kilometers, one of our guides. So you can see that. So what happens in Antarctica is in the summer, just about 1.5% of the margins of the continent, the great continent of Antarctica, the ice melts just in about one one point five percent of the landmass, and that's where all these birds are trying to nest, including the penguins, which are otherwise found only in the sea. And they come to land to breed, and it's a huge challenge for them. So for the early uh, comers, for example, they have to find a dry spot, and they have to find a lot of these small stones to make their nest. So in this case, it's a long trudge trudge for these birds, which are so clumsy on land. Uh, all the way to uh, come up to this nest site. I'll show you some pictures of this is a chin strap penguin with a rock in its beak. And this is the nesting colony right on top of that cliff. So it's a long walk up. And every time they have to go back to the shore to collect another rock and come back here. So each time it's like a two kilometer walk and probably they collect something like 20 rocks. So you can imagine. So this is the nesting colony of Chinstap penguins, the first one we saw. We saw many, but this is the first one we saw. You can see, I have some more pictures to show the relative size of these penguins. So the, the crew has a very tough job. They go and prepare the site and they put these markers all around that uh, nesting site, once again, uh, to, to protect these birds and uh, especially from over eager um, um, tourists and the photographers so that their, their breeding, their nesting doesn't get disturbed. So, um, and see this relative size of the penguin now uh, against these people, just about a little over one foot. And we had get a long briefing before we get off the uh, uh, ship saying that, you know, how we are to keep, uh, us, uh, keep ourselves uh, sufficient uh, safe distance from the penguins, social distancing, so that uh, uh, they, um, um, they don't get disturbed by our presence and uh, blah, blah, blah. So don't go too close and all that huge uh, briefing we get. But the penguins are not aware of that briefing. So they are fascinating in the sense that they are not perturbed about our presence there. But the main reason being that there's no land predators for them. Their only predators are in the sea. So on land, they're not worried at all. So they themselves come so close, they breach that social distancing and come within a few feet of us. And you can see in this, they're all sort of walking in front of these 
guests, excited guests were taking pictures. This is a close-up of this beautiful, beautiful penguin that Chin strapped in. And sure enough, there's some of these scavengers uh, in attendance, wherever there is a nesting uh, colony. And these are these uh, fascinating, cute, I mean, good-looking birds called the sheet bills. This is the close-up of that. And these birds, um, they come into the colonies looking for uh, uh, eggs and sometimes chicks, which are unguarded. And they sort of... Uh, are uh, opportunistic uh, predators of these eggs and chicks mainly. So these are both sheet bills. And then the bigger scavengers and, um, and uh, predators are also waiting. These are the Antarctic squaws. They're also waiting to uh, get their opportunities. This is another species of penguin, uh, perhaps, uh, 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 the, I mean, the most cute of the small penguins, the Adelie penguins. These are also penguins which are only in Antarctica, found only in Antarctica. Uh, they're called the high Arctic penguins, and they're also breeding now. And uh, they're also the similar size, just over a foot uh, uh, in height, and weigh about a uh, maximum of uh, three to four kilos. And they're also busy get, gathering their rocks and uh, uh, re-establishing their pair bondings, and then uh, laying their eggs, incubating them, raising young ones. And look at this, this whole, seen in front of you, including the hillside or the cliffside, is peppered with uh, penguins, the Adelie penguins. And uh, there are some close-up shots. You can see how they collect the rocks. But this is another one called the Gentoo. But sorry, I'll go back to that side. You can see this with my laser pointer. You can see all these are rocks. Just slightly. I would say average 25, 30 rocks they need to uh, collect for each nest. Of course, a lot of commotion happening. Somebody stealing somebody else's rock, and two females are arguing. The males are coming in, getting involved. There's a lot of commotion and a lot of sounds happening. The noise is is like sometimes uh, um, you can't hear the other person speaking. It's, it's, it's incredible the din and the smells of the penguin colonies. This is another penguin called the Gen Two penguin, slightly bigger. You can see the Gen 2 penguins, uh, they're rocks. See, they have to collect a lot of these rocks. They are rock stealing, I would guess. And their predator is this one, a fascinating predator um, called the leopard seal. And these are lurking around on the shores when the penguins are going to uh, the sea to uh, get food for the young ones or for the mates. And these are patrolling the shores and they're like, very powerful predators of the mainly penguins during this time, during breeding time. And I, I, we did see one uh, which actually caught a penguin, but that was slightly far away. But I could see it through my binoculars and was very happy. No photograph, but could see through my binoculars very, very, very clearly. Just caught one, uh, one uh, penguin and uh, just ate it in front of uh, that excited bunch of guests about 50 meters away where I could see all that. Slightly close up shot of the leopard seal. And the other um, um, scavengers and sometimes predators waiting. This is the uh, um, a gull species, just like the bigger gull you saw there, the glaucous gull. This is known as the kelp gull, which is found in the southern hemisphere. Oh, sorry, southern seas and Antarctica. A pair of them, and sometimes they're up on these uh, ice flows. And then we got very lucky uh, to see uh, this uh, fascinating penguin. The Largest of the uh, largest of them all, the emperor penguin. Largest would mean they're about maximum four foot high, three and a half to four uh, feet high, but they're the largest there. And uh, why uh, uh, very uh, uncommon or rare sighting is that these penguins uh, they finish the breeding in the winter. You must have seen all those footages of these um, um, penguins, the happy feet, and all those uh, films. Um, they breed uh, in the winter of Antarctica, unlike all of the penguins which breed in summer. So they're somewhere uh, very deep inside the continent, not on the shelves. And during this time, the summer, they're solitary and they're just uh, around, they're not in colonies. So it's really difficult to see them. In fact, our, the expedition to Antarctica was titled In Search of the Emperor Penguin. And we got lucky, there was one, one of the guides, I'm forgetting his name, he was telling me that it was his fifth or sixth trip and he saw it for the first time. The emperor penguin. I have a few more slides of the emperor penguin. It's um, swimming in the waters next to the ship. 
And uh, this is uh, an interesting movement they do to save energy instead of walking up because, uh, you know, they're, like I said, clumsy on the land, uh, beautiful and graceful in the sea. So in order to save energy, they just do this, uh, what is known as tobogganing. They just <laughs> fall on their bellies and just uh, you know, slide through the eyes. That's what this sensor penguin is demonstrating getting into the water and this was like well, another sighting we had some three sightings of it and this guy this chap was actually giving a show look at the number of uh, inflatable boats the zodiacs all around um, um, him or her i don't know uh, uh, but this uh, reminded me of bandhavgarh tiger sighting <laughs> so there were some five or six uh, zodiacs each zodiac carries about 10 to 12 people so they were all fascinated by this penguin and he was holding this his audience like this I know proudly he was there for about, he or she, I don't know, sorry, for about uh, 10 odd minutes before he uh, decided to uh, tobogan himself um, away from the. This is how the water is so clear and so beautiful blue in color. And this is how uh, we get off the ship, like I said, in the Zodiacs. And there'll be one expedition leader uh, who will uh, not only drive the Zodiac, but he's there, sometimes she to help us get on, get off, and then do some amount of guiding. There's not a great amount of guiding because they have to do more of regulating the people and uh, things like that. For example, there's a very um, uh, very uh, strictly followed uh, guideline or rule saying that not more than 100 people can be on any island at any given time. So, so um, they regulate that very well. We are 106 and the ship was full. So they make sure that the first zodiac which has landed is already off with its passengers uh, off the island before the last one uh, lands and things like that. And um, like I showed you the markers which they have to put to protect the penguins uh, from intruding visitors and a lot of other things like that. So they have to manage the crowd more than guiding. But on the ship, of course, like I said, there are a lot of talks and very interesting stuff happening. This is another fascinating bird of the, um, of the southern seas, the uh, giant petrel, which is um, two meter wingspans. And the big birds, they are, uh, give you some details of these. Giant petrel, um, the wingspan is about two meters, weigh up to, uh, up to four to five kilos, uh, mainly scavengers uh, of the uh, Antarctic um, islands when the, uh, when the penguins come for breeding, mainly penguins and other birds too. And they also eject their vomit as a defense. And they're big birds. And you can see the, the and this is one of the tube noses. Uh, other day, a, a gentleman was giving a presentation on the pelagic birds and uh, the albatrosses, the shearwaters, and the petrels are all a part of that family, the tube noses. You can see it's very clear tube, uh, I mean, the tube nose. Uh, this is another fascinating uh, albatross, um, the uh, gray headed albatross. Like I was reading out that uh, record, which was, uh, which was tagged and it. Um, uh, was found to have uh, covered uh, 13,670 miles. That's something like 16,000 kilometers or 17,000 kilometers in 46 days. Um, so this is that gray-headed, no, I mean, not a particular bird, but that species. Fascinating. And this is another species uh, uh, called the light-mantled sooty albatross. Beautiful name, beautiful bird. And they're usually found in pairs. They hunt in pairs. Right, metal suit albatross. This is the close, slightly closer shot I could get. Uh, I hope I'm doing okay on time, David. This is another um, the uh, southern fulmar. We saw the uh, northern fulmar in the Arctic. This is the uh, southern fulmar, if you will, M A R, M A R. And this is a very handsome bird, the Cape Petrel. Uh, Cape Petrels, yeah, Cape Petrels in the water. Um, did you see other petrels like the, um, the uh, Storm Petrels, Wilson's Petrels and things like that, but I, I didn't get any pictures. But uh, there are quite a few petrel species there. Uh, this is one uh, time when we had a long uh, zodiac ride uh, to do to go and see another species of penguins, which are uh, um, uh, breeding or their breeding colonies were up on rocks, which is called the macaroni penguin. And uh, this was like an hour uh, um, ride on the zodiacs to go and see them. And so these are the macaroni penguins. They're slightly far, just got some record shots of them. Uh, but uh, these are also small sized penguins, but fascinating hairstyle they have. I, I think I have an illustration of that. 
Yeah, slight, slightly better shot than Macaroni's image. Uh, this is uh, the uh, blue eyed shag, or it's a cormorant species, is found in Antarctica, also known as the imperial shag. Penguins are, they're made for the sea. And the way they um, swim in the sea and the way they literally fly on the surface of the sea is uh, fascinating to watch and um, very, very graceful in the sea. Uh, so uh, uh, they can go, uh, they can swim uh, uh, up to speeds of 25 kilometers per hour. And some of them dive up to 550 meters. Some emperor penguins have, have been recorded to dive up to 565, sorry, meters. And uh, up to 22 minutes, they can uh, hold their breath and, and dive in for food. So fascinating. Sometimes you see them coming back to the shore in this beautiful, graceful, uh, um, uh, you know, glides over the water. You can see that. I think this is Adelie Penguin. Look at that beautiful color of the ocean. It's fascinating. Uh, this is the Antarctic, um, the uh, food uh, uh, web of the Antarctic uh, oceans, um, just like the um, Arctic. Here also, this is the 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 base of the this food chain is uh, the uh, phytoplanktons and the zooplanktons, um, um, which are in turn fed in by krill. And krill, there is an abundance of krill in Antarctica, uh, on which uh, you have squids and seals and other fish feeding. And then you have birds feeding off the krill, and then you have this beautiful baleen whales which feed off the um, uh, krill, and then penguins, of course. And uh, some of here, the albatrosses and other seabirds come in because they feed on the squid, um, and, and um, sometimes even krill. So this is the uh, food chain there. And some of the um, small icebergs and some big icebergs, I have a few shots of them just to share with you the, the very beautiful landscape of Antarctica. Um, and the iceberg, there's a whole talk on icebergs we got. I think two, two, uh, talk one, talk two on, on icebergs and the role. And um, I'll, I repeat, you can just go for the lands, landscapes of Antarctica um, on Antarctic. For under, in Antarctica, you can just go for icebergs. They're fascinating. This is known as the tabular iceberg. These are really big ones. Um, something on icebergs, I have some interesting information for you. Uh, the, one of the largest icebergs, there are very many large icebergs which break off, but one of the one, one iceberg which made big news uh, was, uh, is named, codenamed B15 in the year 2000. And uh, it is, uh, the size of it is uh, 295 uh, uh, kilometers long into 37 kilometers wide. And it's, uh, the, entire, uh, the area it covered is 10,915 square kilometers. One recent one, which is uh, named D28, is uh, the area is about, um, no, it covers is about 1,600 square kilometers, and it's 210 meters thick. And it's estimated to be holding 315, hold your breath, 315 billion, billion, B, billion tons of ice. That's the kind of, uh, you know, um, I mean, uh, size and what they, uh, what they uh, hold in terms of fresh water, these icebergs, they're fascinating. Uh, and one thing which I could never really uh, understand is that how these birds, which are so uh, clumsy on land, can climb right on top of this uh, iceberg. These are some Adelie penguins which climb right on top of this iceberg. They're really, they, they slip and, you know, they're not meant to be on land. Okay, um, oh, oh, just uh, um, uh, while well, uh, we left the Antarctic, the main uh, continent of Antarctica, uh, the Weddell Sea and that part, we saw a lot of other wildlife, including seals and uh, killer whales. And I didn't put any slides of that in this presentation because it's about birds. And so on the return, um, when we crossed the Drake Passage, we came to the Falkland Islands, which, uh, which is about 500 kilometers of the, 500 miles, I think, off the coast of Argentina. And there, again, you have a lot of other penguins. This is, uh, again, Gen 2 penguins uh, nesting. Um, um, some of them are already early nesters. So this one has uh, two chicks, twins, the Gen 2 penguin. And we saw the king penguins there. Uh, these are the most colorful of the penguins. The emperor penguin is the largest, but it's not as colorful. This is a very good looking uh, penguins in that sense. 
or king penguins. And this, you can see this chick, this is a fledgling from last year of the king penguin. They're just left there, they literally fend for themselves. They have these little crashish um, uh, nurseries where the young ones are there and um, the waiting for the parents to come back. I'm sure you saw some of these document, documentaries showing all that. This is another king penguin. And uh, uh, in fact, here in this, uh, the males were showing off the colors and the size of the beaks. And they have this beautiful display, which they do pointing out the, this is the male and this is the female. The beak size tells you that. And so they, what they do is to, to impress the female, uh, 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 some kind of a coating behavior. They put their uh, beak up in the air and hold it as high as possible uh, for a few minutes. And then they display their beautiful plumage and their, their ability to hold their beaks high up. If you have a few um, uh, predators or uh, scavenging birds which are around, this is the crested uh, caracara and this is the striated caracara on the Falkland Islands. This is the turkey vulture in flight and some of the wader birds. This is uh, a uh, Magellanic oyster catcher. Then we have the dolphin gull and this is the Falkland or the brown skua. And this is uh, the, uh, the another penguin species we saw, the Magellanic penguin, the seventh penguin species we saw. And these are ground, uh, they nest uh, in uh, uh, hollows in the ground like this. Magellanic repair. And one fascinating, fascinating uh, uh, sites was this fantastically abundant uh, uh, nesting colony of the black broad albatrosses. This is known as an uh, island called the Steeple Jason. And there's a very interesting story behind it. And as far as I, your eye can see, uh, these are, all, all these, all these are nesting black broad albatrosses. Estimated uh, population there, 440,000 um, black broad albatrosses. And this represents 70% of the entire population. And uh, interestingly, uh, about 30 uh, to 40 years back, um, the, uh, there was a lot of uh, um, uh, human pressure on these islands. The, it was like uh, it had livestock and things like that. But uh, there were some interventions made, and um, the uh, the pressures were removed. And uh, in, uh, the World Conservation Society, actually WCS, uh, I mean a, one of the, those uh, eco philanthropists, I don't remember his name. He bought this island and uh, gifted that to WCS, who manages this island now. And nature has simply rebounded there. And it's become the largest colony of blackboard albatrosses in the world, like I said, 70% uh, of the entire population. So it was, we spent a fascinating three, four hours there. It's just a sea of these birds. Uh, this is the kelp. This is one of our guides on the ship. Uh, he's, a, he's the one who did know us on Emperor Penguin until this journey. So, uh, so you can see some of these uh, uh, shots of these uh, albatrosses which are nesting. Albatrosses also uh, form uh, pair, uh, they pair for life. And uh, once the breeding time comes, uh, it's the males which first go and uh, find the right place uh, for to build a nest. And then they do this um, uh, courtship behavior once again to reestablish their uh, pair bonding. And then the uh, mating and the breeding, all that starts. This is what they build, the males. A small little uh, mud, uh, a nest made of uh, a hollow mud, mud uh, bowl. And then the females come, they reestablish the prayer bonds, and then the whole process starts incubation and raising the young ones. Another male on the next side. And here we saw intermingling, uh, mingled with these uh, blackboard albatrosses, the last of our penguin species, the rock hoppers. And these are small, smaller than even the chin strap, just about one foot in height. Uh, cute, cute penguins, the rock hoppers. Yes, slightly better shot of the rock hoppers. So this is uh, a slide to show you the eight different uh, penguin species uh, which live in Antarctica and around in those islands. And we were very, very lucky we saw all of them, including this the emperor penguin, like I said, which is usually not easy to see. Uh, so eight different species. There you are. I think that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I hope you Thank enjoyed you so it. Much, sir. Thank you, David. Yeah, it was very good to see all this. I don't know if I will ever be able to see all this thing.
<laughs> so if you have any questions you please come in the chat box and ask the question so that you can check the chat box there yeah yeah chat box actually here the chat box not on my top screen one minute your bottom next to the participants next to the share no, screen no participants actually went up for uh, for me on okay, the screen next, yeah next to the share screen then participants and share share screen top share and more i think i'll just look at no not on the more mm -hmm. just to just disable this hidden Strangely, I can't find my chat box. Just a minute. You can read out meanwhile, uh, David. Some. Okay, because I I was out of network for a few times, so. Okay, okay. It's there, sure. I'll just read out. Yeah. Do these birds change uh, its plumage during courtship, Shanmugam Kumar? Albatrosses. Yeah, they already develop a new plumage. Uh, they do change. Um, they they molt you know, before uh, the actual courtship and uh, breeding starts. Yes, they do. uh it's look like a shutter island of uh, capri can anyone repeat the island name please which island i think the black broad ah that's called steeple jason steeple jason j s o j a s o n yeah in parklands please tell me thing about our research station himadri in arctic dr meera uh oh sorry sorry uh himadri in arctic yeah what about it uh, oh very good explain okay 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 um it was uh, we went to one research station which was uh, um, um i mean uh, owned or managed by uh, the Urge by argentina um and um, there was another literature which i read on the on the ship saying that there are some 50 different research stations so uh, the uh, place where we land that is uh, we do all our exploration which is called the weddell sea that's not where the uh, indian research station is it's somewhere on the other side uh, in fact we have two i believe so um, uh, we couldn't go anywhere close to that we just went to one argentinian research station any other questions did you see northern lights ah northern lights are in the arctic uh, very frequently asked question for me Uh, but uh, what happens is that the um, uh, wildlife uh, uh, viewing season and the season for the northern lights uh, don't uh, overlap obviously because we go uh, to the arctic to svalbard during the summer arctic summer to see all these birds and the polar bears and other animals um, and the arctic lights the northern lights sorry northern lights start once the winter comes in around the uh, um, end of september october like that so Uh, we couldn't see. Sorry, I went twice, but both the times we couldn't see. Okay. Uh, what are the mothers to take census of these birds? Do you know anything about how do they do tend the census? Um, good question. Uh, I spoke to some volunteers, which uh, research as uh, volunteers or assistants who who were there on the Steeple Jason uh, Black Broad uh, nesting colony site, and uh, they were uh, speaking about uh, they do a kind of a um, what do you call what is that method called on the land itself to the binoculars and um, block counting kind of a method they do and they also have tagged some birds uh, not for census but for studying their ranging behavior and how far they go to get the food for the young ones and things like that so they do this uh, um, classic uh, block counting method to uh, to uh, to count the birds on the ground okay where uh, elephant seals also there Yes, yes. Elephant seals also were there. Um, big, um, I'm forgetting the collective <laughs> rafts or something. They were there. Yes, elephant seals were there. Four other seal species, including the leopard seal, um, sea lions were there, um, and uh, Weddell sea like that. A few. I think five different uh, seal species we could see. Okay. Uh, any suggestion? Suggested books for birds of polar regions, flora and all. Mm, there is there is um uh, i'll share my email id if you can send me an email i'll send it back because i don't have that list with me yeah. here 
Uh, definitely, there are some very interesting, very nice books. Yes, I don't remember them off. Can you just put your email ID there, sir? Where should I put? Again, because I'm not able to find my chat. Okay. So it's simple. It's uh, I can uh, uh, tell it orally. Kabini, Kabini, K B I N I, M A N, man, Kabini, man at yahoo.com or gmail.com. Okay, Kabini, M A N. Okay, I just put it up. Yeah, please. Okay. Are there any bird watching trips organized in these regions, or how does it work? Yeah, so uh, for example, the trips which uh, uh, you know I uh, organized there uh, to this company called Ocean Wide Expeditions, it depends on what you want to focus. Uh, it could be just birds, yes, because the uh, Antarctic trip is for uh, ten full days in Antarctica, two days to cross the Drake Passage, two days to cross back, so fourteen days. And similarly, the Arctic trip is for ten days from Long Bay. So it's plenty of time just to focus on birds if you if you if you like. And they're very good guides on board and, uh, and things like that. And also, like I said, it's 24 hours or 22 hours at least of uh, daylight. So there's a lot of time for you to do bird watching. So one of these uh, kind of uh, expedition cruises is ideal to uh, go. Of course, it seems like a, uh, a dream for me now. I don't know when one can go back there. It seems like from some other planet. So hopefully, a few years down the line, one can go back. Mm -hmm. Commercial whaling or fishing happening in Polaris region? Oh, I see chat box now. Yes. Okay. Uh, I saw the chat box now. Sorry. Uh, commercial uh, whaling not in Antarctic uh, uh, seas. There's a. Uh, that's a one good piece of good uh, one good one piece of good news is that uh, there's something called the Antarctica Treaty, which was signed uh, first in 1961. It came into uh, uh, implementation stage. Uh, and currently, there are 54 countries which signed that. And under that treaty, um, there's no commercial exploitation of the Antarctica mainland um, itself. And there's some extent of ocean also. No commercial exploitation, no uh, military presence, um, and things like that. So it's, uh, it's uh, good. And it's been extended about five years back. I think uh, they signed it again. And it's extended to 2048. Great news for the planet. That Antarctica as a continent, it's uh, that um, uh, to its natural uh, uh, <clears throat> self. Can you see any other questions, sir? In the box? yeah, let me see. Quickly go through. Probably take two, three more questions. Sure. Do you think that the pollution? This is by uh, Nuruddin Jabbar. Do you think that pollution of the habitat is a problem that that causes extinction of polar regions? Yes. I mean this. This COVID has really given us a huge wake-up call uh, to tell us that the entire world, the entire globe is interconnected. Uh, so similarly, all the oceans of the world are interconnected. So although the Antarctic, the southern seas, uh, which girdle the Antarctic continent, themselves are not having direct pollution there, but there's enough pollution from other parts of the globe, other oceans, which finds its way to Antarctica. In fact, uh, um, uh, while talking about albatrosses, I uh, did not share with you that eight of the 22 species found in the world are critically endangered. And the main reason being they're caught in these um, fishing nets. That's the main reason, the, the foremost reason for that. So yes, pollution is reaching Antarctica, uh, both in terms of you know, water pollution and plastic pollution, which is uh, really the sad part of it. Vinit, what is the qualification for an aspiring naturalist to, to be an apprentice for such trips? Well, all naturalists are qualified to be apprentices. Let's do an apprentice trip to the poles. I'll be very happy to go with all of you. Um, Shalmung is on. Great. OK, how many bird species are possible in one trip? Uh, uh, to the Arctic, Arctic has some 50 odd bird species, and uh, we could see almost 35 of them. Similarly, Antarctica, like I said, eight species of penguins. We saw five species of uh, albatrosses. One uh, I couldn't get a picture of was a beautiful sight, a little far away of the wandering albatross. Uh, so uh, uh, Antarctica, the list including penguins was about 35 again. 
So um, out of the 45 odd in Antarctica, 35 we saw, and out of the 55 there we saw about 38. I, think. I, I don't really remember the count. Are the penguins in Africa? Yes, there are penguins in Africa. Uh, you have the uh, blue penguins, I think they're called, or they're found near the Cape Town um, area. Similarly, the penguins in uh, Australia and New Zealand. And the northernmost species is, uh, uh, yeah, Magellanic also comes to South Africa. The northernmost species is in, uh, found in Galapagos, the Galapagos Islands. Where's my cursor? Any, any other questions you can read, uh, David? Hey, why is it? Sorry. I think the most of them are done. So okay, that, great. Is, yeah. Okay, I think uh, we can close the session now. It's 20. Thank you so much, uh, Sharat. Uh, it was a fantastic session. I'm so happy to hear you again. It's been an absolute and, pleasure. Thanks, uh, everybody, for joining in. Uh, on behalf of all the Nature Society and Nature, uh, I mean, Cotton Nature Society and Alpine Natural History Society, you know, we extend our thanks. Uh, so those who are uh, Thank you. listening, uh, Please keep a watch for next uh, few sessions. We have uh, some amazing sessions coming in. Thank you so much. Uh, stay safe, all of you, and stay healthy. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kodam.